start, uh, if you remember, we were discussing some additive manufacturing technologies uh, on Tuesday. I will continue on that and then probably we will have time and I will start discussing CNC process planning or some other uh, conventional type of manufacturing uh, methods. We will be discussing again the generative design and generative uh, process planning approaches. This was, as you see, a stereotypical process. Uh, we discussed that there's a laser, we need to have support structures, the interior is solid so that uh, the laser should actually cover the whole slice. Uh, you cannot have infield percentages. It's a bit complicated than uh, stereotography, the paths and the support structures, and in SLS, you don't have any support structures. Here you see some examples uh, for the support structures. And there's an issue related to this SLA uh, method. For instance, if the, you are going to print such a toy, and if that is your table, uh, wheel table, and if you place your part in this configuration, then as you see this part, this region will stick to the table. This is the table. And it's quite difficult to actually, after this part is manufactured, it's quite difficult to remove it from the uh, table. You need to have some special tools, and even with them, you may harm your uh, printed product. And that's why actually, uh, most of people prefer to use kind of a uh, base, which is made of kind of support structures, and your original model, model is this blue one. And once you have this part fabricated, then by using some simple mechanical tools, you can remove these support structures and have your part in high quality manner. Now let me uh, discuss another uh, resin-based additive manufacturing method. This is called digital light processing. It's DLP technology. Uh, it, if you compare it with SLA, they are using same type of uh, resin and this resin is actually cured again with the help of light, but this time they are using, it's a very special machine, they are using the light of the screen of your mobile phone. material is photopolymer. Now, after uh, they reflect some images, the white regions of these images will be cured, they will be polymerized, and the black regions uh, will stay as liquid. <laughs> phone is simply reflecting images and with the help of these images the process is completed there is nothing more <laughs> complicated uh, products with the help of this technology and this is as I mentioned called as digital light processing as simpler than SLA it doesn't have any path blending issues you don't need to uh, cover the interior of the slice 
you simply have an uh, image of the slide and that's it. Once you reflect it, then the white regions will be cured and the black parts, the black regions in your image will not be curing any material. So liquid material actually residing inside these black regions will stay as liquid. And this is faster, obviously, since uh, we don't have a kind of a hat covering the whole slice. In just a few seconds, you can handle the whole slice. So that's why it's much faster. And we have some support structures, as in the case of SLA, depending on the complexity, you need to use support structures. As I mentioned, uh, during the slicing, uh, during your printing process, the machine, the mobile form, or in more uh, complicated DLP systems, they are using uh, projectors. They are all reflecting such binary images, white and black images. These white regions will be cured, and the black ones will stay as liquid. And this is some uh, example slices from Stanford Pony, the base and the ears. As you see, this is a body, a body part. And with the help of this, uh, black images, binary images, the process can be completed. Any questions, guys, up to now about this process is a bit uh, different than other processes. Ojam, uh, what are the advantages of this process? Uh, first of all, you need to use support structures and the resulting product is made of photopolymer it's not as uh, strong as, let's say, SLS or peaceful and fabrication systems. Its strength is less. And other thing is, as again, you are using a liquid material. It needs to be protected from light. You should store your material properly. Otherwise, once it's actually exposed to some light, uh, you may start photopolymerization and your material will be solidified and polymerized. And the advantages actually have, um, it has more advantages. For instance, with SLA and DLP, you can produce very small parts, little parts having different features as we have seen in the previous video. Uh, they were printing a kind of a lattice structure. It's quite uh, impossible in uh, free fabrication process, for instance. And it's a nice advantage of the LP. And the biggest disadvantage is that the materials, uh, they don't have uh, high mechanical properties and it's mostly used for ornaments or jewelry industries. Any other questions, guys? This is another process, uh, which is called as sheet lamination processes, as the name implies. We will have some sheets of different materials, put them on top of each other, and then try to do, obtain, try to manufacture some 3D products. So once you put them on top of each other, uh, after each addition of a sheet, you need to do some forming process. You may cut it, you may uh, cut with a laser, with a knife. There are all possibilities. And this is a bit different than other uh, processes. To add non-toxic chemicals, yes. like you can see some uh, stack of sheet paper here. Uh, the machine actually grabs one sheet from the side and then puts it on the table, and then it has a kind of an adhesive at the back side of the paper. It presses that paper, and with the help of this pressing, uh, the new paper actually sticks to the previous layers or papers. And then what this machine does is that uh, it has a knife, kind of a knife here. It passes through the whole uh, contour. And in this uh, manufacturing uh, process, they are trying to print a kind of a hammer made of wood, or you can say a paper. Some of our competitors really rely. A new paper has been put on the table. Now mechanical cutter will pass through this the contour. This is how the technology works. Cutting to contour. MCOR 3D printers include a piece of software. This is their contract manufacturing software. They can obtain the slices, 
do some coloring options, do have some textures on specific parts. A slice it. And what slice it does is that it takes in the digital file and it slices the model digitally, each layer equivalent to the thickness of a slice of paper. If you're printing in color, you have two options. Either you get your file with your color information on it, or if you don't have that, you can use another piece of software by MCOR called Colorit, which enables you to apply color to a regular STL or white file before sending it to Slices. Once the color has been applied in Colorit, you then import the model into Slices and prepare your model on the screen before you send it to the actual 3D printer. Printing in color is a two-stage process. So when you have your color model in Slices, when you hit generate layers, not only does it work out the cut profile around the geometry, it also works out the color along that path. Then we hit print and we send that color information to a 2D printer that takes the... So they are using 2D printers. They are printing the slices with the conventional printers, as you see, and they're all in color. This is one of the advantages of the process you can obtain colorful objects. In the previous ones, it's not possible. You can only have a single color, but this one has such an advantage. Core ink and prints that color in duplex onto each sheet. We then take those sheets of paper and load them into a 3D printer for 3D printing. The process that we have invented is called Selective Deposition Lamination, or SDL. And as the name suggests, we selectively deposit the adhesive. So what that means is that on the very first layer, we apply adhesive. Another issue is that uh, the remaining part of the paper is actually divided, as you see, into some squares. And if you put, put the papers on top of each other, then that means in 3D, uh, the unused regions are actually divided into some cube-like shapes. And this is kind of a support structure, somehow similar to selective laser sintering process. After the part is ready, then they can simply take these uh, cubes out of their, let's say, building block. But in two different ways. On the waste material, we put down a very low density adhesive, and on the part itself, we put down a very high density adhesive. Then what happens is that a new sheet is pulled in from the paper tray. It's placed on top of the freshly applied adhesive. The whole plate is pressed up against a heat plate, which makes sure we have a positive bond between the two layers. The build plate comes down and it's ready for the next process. When the build plate returns to the build height, an adjustable tungsten carbide blade cuts just one layer at a time, tracing out the object that we're trying to make. When the cutting sequence is complete, the machine immediately starts to apply the next layer of adhesive. A new layer is pulled in, pressed together and cut, and the whole process is repeated over and over until all the layers are pulled into the machine. When all the layers are done, the part is finished and can be removed. The whole benefit of the SDL process becomes apparent when you actually try to remove the waste material from the finished object. Because we applied higher density adhesive for the part and lower density adhesive on the waste, it means that the waste material comes off very easy. Also, to make it easier to remove the waste, the waste material is cut up into cubes, or as we call it, dicing, which means that the waste material can be removed very easily into nice little blocks. That means that you can get very intricate parts out of your model when it's finished. Unlike other technologies, M-Core 3D printed parts do not require dipping in toxic chemicals. The 3D printed object comes out very tough and very durable. If you want to make parts that can be drilled, tapped or water resistant, you can give them a quick dip and they're ready to go. Paper as a build material offers distinct advantages in terms of enabling wire accessible, professional quality 3D printing. There is no more affordable, safe or color rich approach and our SDL technology is suitable for any office, school, healthcare, laboratory or setting where people are learning, working or healing. This accessibility delivers what 3D printing has promised yet struggled to deliver for years. The ability for virtually everyone to improve the designs, shorten design cycles and win more business. Termination process you have another schematic which is very similar to the previous process again it's called as heat lamination protocol laminate object manufacturing you can see that uh, as opposed to the previous one we have an 
effectively putting the material here in a roll form, like a microfit. Uh, the material will just spat into the steel chamber. And we have another uh, roll here which is storing the excess material. And uh, we have a laser instead of the rotation cutter in the series process this time. John, ben, this is all of your mama. Do you hear me now? Let's try uh, another microphone. What about now? Do you hear me? Hocam şimdi de arkadan bir ses geliyor. What about now? Daha iyi hocam. Much better or just a bit better? Much better hocam. Okay. Sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, let me then repeat this part once again. Uh, so this is a very similar process to the previous one. Uh, it was a kind of a commercial product. Product. This is a schematic of laminated object manufacturing. Laminated object manufacturing. And here we have a kind of a roll here. Uh, this is initial roll material. It's fed actually into the table. And then we have another role. This is storing the excess material, as you see. And the rest is somehow similar. Uh, instead of a cutter, cutter this time, we have a laser. And the function of the laser is the same again. It's cutting the contours. And the remaining part of the object is, the remaining part of the table is divided into, as you see, such kind of uh, squares. And at the end of the process, uh, they will be easily removed from your building block but the rest is the same another issue here uh, at the back side of this paper they have a kind of an uh, adhesive and it's heated with this roller here and then it makes it actually uh, paper easily stick to the previous layer so these are the fundamentals of uh, laminated object manufacturing or sheet lamination process any questions, guys, about this process? Teacher, can I ask something? Sure, Mitad. Uh, so, in general, our slices normally in the FFF uh, fused filamentation, uh, 3D printers and SLA, they are resins and, like, let's say, uh, polymers or other materials. But in this one, every slice is made out of paper. Yep, this is made out of paper. And it doesn't have to be just paper. It may be, um, uh, let's say, a PVC material, a plastic material. This roll may be made of PVC or different uh, simple, simpler materials. But there are also different versions of sheet lamination process where they use sheet metals. But in that case, they don't use a roller. They use some uh, specific kind of foils and they have specific, obviously, hats, and they uh, spread the spoil on the table and try to machine instead of cutting. Instead of laser, they do some kind of a machine if it's a metal material. But with paper and PVC, this laser or mechanical knives are enough to do the, enough to complete the process. And the thing about the, Trajectory planning is, and this process is not complicated. You need to only have the, think about if this is the body of the bunny, then the contour is just okay. And the rest is divided into some, as you see, grids. But the rest is not that complicated. You don't need to fill the interior or you don't need to have some shells. A single contour is fine. These are the things we discussed. We have a solid interior. Yes, this is important. We don't have infill percentage. Since we are just cutting from the contour, the interior will stay as it is and it will be 100% filled. Now we are actually done with the additive manufacturing processes. Do you have questions? Uh, we can briefly discuss, compare some of these methods. If you don't have, then we can 
jump to CNC process planning. Okay, guys. Can I ask? Sure, Alun. Uh, in the sheet lamination process, do we have any specific uh, sheet thickness? Or we have thicker she sheets or just proper sheets? Actually, it's better you have as thin as possible since once you have thinner sheets, then the accuracy or the uh, quality of your resulting shape will be much better. But if you have thicker ones, then that means in a shorter time, you can complete the process. And another problem in thicker sheets is that you need to have a uh, longer, actually deeper knife or more powerful laser. And once you have more powerful laser, then you have the chance of actually burning some of the region. So this is a kind of a trade-off and you should uh, consider all these issues and then decide on the thickness of your paper or sheet matter. Another? Okay, then let's jump to uh, CNC process planning. In CNC process planning, what do we have? We have the obviously process plan and in this process plan, we need to determine uh, the root of the part. Since in your factory, you have different types of CNC systems, CNC machines, you may have a turning machine, a milling machine, a drilling machine. So you need to have a kind of a root, the steps of your uh, processes. So in each station, you need to know what type of processes are to be performed, what are their parameters. Since in a turning machine, you may have different spindle speeds for specific parts. These all should be set before you start the manufacturing process. You need to determine the type of machine you are going to use since you may have several uh, turning machines, turning centers. You need to select one of it. And since, as you know, on these machines, we have many tool options. Depending on the type of your product, type of hole you are going to produce, or type of, uh, let's say, other mechanical features you are going to manufacture, you should decide in advance on these uh, tools, tool types, their depth, their lengths, diameters, they all should be defined before you start manufacture. Another issue, uh, since you are using different machines and fixing is quite important in CNC in subtractive manufacturing, since we have high forces uh, coming from the cutting operation and in the additive manufacturing, as you have seen, we have the parts always stick to the table. We don't have special fixtures holding your part, but in CNC, you need to have some kind of clamps or other special fixtures. So before again, you start the manufacturing, you should decide on the fixture or if, it, if, if your part is a new one, then you need to design a new fixture, which is specifically manufactured for your part. So what do we have in plan selection? Uh, while we are trying to manufacture a part, we need to first consider the shape of it, the size of it, the tolerances it has. If it has high tolerances, let's say, then you need to use uh, some high quality machines. You cannot obtain these tolerance levels once you use the conventional systems. And another important thing about the whole manufacturing process is the required surface quality. Uh, again, depending on the surface quality, you should decide on all these, uh, on the details of process plan. Obviously the material is another important issue, whether you are machining a polymer or a metal, so depending on the type of material, this whole plan may be modified. So what do we need to do actually in uh, manual planning? First of all, you start with an engineering drawing. So you need to know, you need to understand what is written in this drawing. You need to be able to interpret this engineering drawing. And another issue, you need to know the details of all manufacturing processes you have in your company. You, it's better you have some hands-on experience, some practices, otherwise, it might be quite impossible to uh, obtain a whole plan for your manufacturing. You should be familiar with the tools on the machines, 
the fact fixtures you have in the company. And as we discussed, if you don't have a proper fixture, you need to design it. And another issue, you need to have uh, the required resources, the materials, the power, the machines. Otherwise, you cannot complete it in your company. And another issue, you need to do some basic computations on machining time, on manufacturing time. For instance, you may say that that part can be manufactured with three processes and it will take, let's say, five hours. And you should roughly also comment on the cost of this process, since depending on your time and cost values, uh, you may switch to a different process plan. Another thing, you need to be familiar with the raw materials, the woods, the polymers, steel, other type of metals. You should know their basic mechanical properties and depending on the requirement given in your engineering drawing or other documents, you should select the right material for that manufacturing uh, processes. And this is somehow related to the previous one. Uh, you should know all the costs of the processes, the tools, the raw materials, the cost of fixtures. They are all important to determine the final cost of your manufacturing. Here is the example, for instance, uh, assume that this is a product, a concept product, which is to be fabricated. You need to have a technical drawing and then depending on uh, some fundamental uh, things in manufacturing, you can uh, decide on the processes. For instance, first of all, you need to do some uh, handling operation and then drilling operation. So after you decide on these processes, then you need to define, obtain uh, cutter paths for all specific machines. If, you're, if you have a powerful system, powerful machining center, then you may perform all of these processes on the same machine. If that's the case, then you are quite lucky since you don't need to have a complicated uh, plan in your factory. You can just complete all these processes in a single station. So what are the steps in uh, process planning? First of all, you need to study the given shape and do some maybe classification. You may, since in advance, you may have performed many planning processes. You have kind of experience, so you may try to do a simple classification. And if your part belongs to a family, then the things will be quite simpler. And after doing this operation, you may determine the type of process and the type of workstations you need in your process. And later you can have a look at the details of your drawing, check all the mechanical features, for instance, the holes, chamfers, fillets. You need to take some maybe nodes and then try to find the best material you can use in these processes, determine the datum surfaces to start the manufacturing processes. And select the right machines for your each manufacturing process and determine the sequence of operations on these machines. You may start with a rough machining process and then do some finishing machining processes on the same machine. So you have, as you see, we have many processes to be completed and it's not easy, especially if you are starting a new part. If your part is, is quite similar to the previous ones, then in a shorter time, you can uh, cover all these steps. After you have these information, then you can sequence all these uh, operations, which were determined in the previous steps. Then for each operation, you need to select the appropriate tools, the material of the tool, the size of the diameter of the tools. And if it's possible, especially, it's better you try to use the same tool for different operations, since this will save you time. Otherwise, you need to remove that tool from the machine, from the spindle, and then place another one, check the dimensions of it. So that will uh, cost you a lot of, lots of time and it will increase your overall machining time. And lastly, from uh, as last steps, one of the last steps, you need to find the proper fixture for your part. If you have in stock, you can use it. If not, you need to design. And then later what you can do is to simply go through your plan 
and if any modifications are necessary you can do some updates and complete your uh, planning processes and lastly uh, for each actually specific operation after you are uh, after you have selected the tool you may uh, work on the cutting parameters a little bit the spindle speed the feed rate uh, depth of cut such kind of things can be studied so these were uh, the steps for manual process planning but what happens if you have computer aided process planning what will be the advantages first of all uh, you don't you don't need to have high skills to do this uh, process planning the computer actually will be helping you do this process planning that's why it can easily reduce the time you are spending on process planning it can reduce the overall manufacturing cost and the processing times and you will have probably more consistent plans in your factory uh, the traveling paths will be shorter and again you'll gain some time and obviously you have more accurate plans and the overall productivity of your company will be improved with the help of this complicated process planning here's a simple example not a completely uh computer aided process planning but we have some aid from the computers uh, this is called as group technology based retrieval system as you see we have the term here retrieval which means that we have some information some database and uh, we are trying to get the information from there and try to classify our new part according to these families once you find a proper family then you can use the machining processes machining plan uh, in the same family and this will again save you lots of time and money you see for instance you, you can check the code of the parts and then try to find a new family and if that's the case then you can continue on playing the rest of this manufacturing sequences so once your database database is good enough then you may simply skip this initial two steps. You may directly start from uh, process plan retrieval and then do little updates and go with the process plan editing. But if it's a new part, totally new part uh, from the available families, then you need to form a new family. This is actually kind of an, a variant process planning. We have the families. What are the disadvantages of this uh, group technology approach? Uh, since you have some families, you kind of have a limitation in terms of similarities between the components. And another thing, you cannot actually have unskilled labor in this process. Again, you need to be aware of some manufacturing processes, machines, setups, the tools. Again, you need to have some experienced planners. And after this uh, retrieval, you cannot generate the complete uh, plan. Again, you need to work on it. So right now, with the help of this variant process planning, we cannot, we cannot have entire low-automated manufacturing systems. This is quite difficult with this uh, option with group technology approach. You need to have, again, some experience to finalize the machining plants so what are the advantages obviously once you have the families uh, if you come up with a similar part then things will be easier you need to do a little programming not too much but again at least you need to have some basic knowledge in terms of machines again programming and other tools and another thing uh, this time the, your system is much more in understandable and you can easily control the whole plan. The plan is under your control. And it's easier to learn, so and obviously easier to use in your upcoming uh, manufacturing processes. Then we have another process for computated process planning. This is called a generative approach. And as the name implies, uh, the computer actually generates the whole plan for us. This is uh much let's say smarter compared to the previous one so it has a kind of an again 
a database and uses all these information available and try to generate a new one for your specific part. And in this approach, it has descriptions of many parts, manufacturing database. It is a kind of a decision-making logic and some algorithms to make it as smooth as possible. But obviously it's quite difficult to implement. And once you implement it, then you have many advantages. What are they, for instance, we can generate these plans in a shorter time. We can have uh, the plans of new products, again, in a shorter time, in a cost-efficient manner. And you may embed this actual generative approach into your automated manufacturing facility. So your company in overall may be more automated with the help of this generated this, uh, process planning approach. So what are the key developments in, in generative approach. Uh, first of all, you need to know the logic of the process planning and it should be identified and then stored into your databases and you will be using them in your upcoming manufacturing processes. And while you are giving inputs, the parts should be clearly defined and they should be defined obviously in a computer compatible format, otherwise, your approach, your algorithm will not be able to understand uh, the fundamentals of your manufacturing process. And you may have some maybe extra information inside, for instance, that you may say that there are such holes and these need to be machined. But the difficulty is that uh, once you don't provide such extra information, then your generative approach should uh, recognize all the features in the part. For instance, what are the features, the holes, some grooving options, some chamfers, they should be all recognized by the algorithm, but it's not that easy. Uh, it needs to do many operations, check the geometric model, uh, try to find some orientations. So it's highly difficult, but it may be using a kind of a pattern recognition method. You may, it may have an uh, state transition diagram. It may decompose your part into smaller parts and then decide on the manufacturing operations. It may try to match it with some available graphs or it may do some grooving operation, face grooving. So it will, by the help of this, it will understand what type of features are present in your uh, part. So we have many difficulties, as I said, in feature recognition. There are numerous number of actually uh, features available in literature. It's quite difficult to recognize all of them. And some of these features might be domain specific or company specific. And we don't have a proper theory in actually in terms of features in literature. And you may have some algorithms, but obviously their time complexities, computation complexity will be much higher. Uh, and we cannot maybe obtain a proper, let's say, uh, process plan for a complicated part. And the ones actually we have in literature are uh, limited for very simple features, simple parts. It, once, you are, once you give these simple parts into these algorithms, they can present you the process plan, but they are not capable of presenting uh, the plans for complicated shapes. So let's have a look at this plan. Uh, this uh, plot, I'm sorry, uh, in, in actually 1975, around 1975, we have the group technology variant system invented. And after that, as you see, the intelligence of the systems began increasing. And this is the way you see. And after the introduction of expert systems, we have an uh, increase again in the intelligence of the system. It goes, as you see, until 2010, let's say. And right now, people are working on such a generative approach. And once they finalize it, then we will have the same intelligence level with the humans. But right now, we are probably around this level, maybe 10 years or 20 years later, we will have the same intelligence level with the human machining experts. Any questions, guys, up to this point? Teacher, can I ask something uh, about mm -hmm. variant process planning? 
Uh, in the 39th uh, presentation, uh, in the group technology-based retrieval system, we are first uh, doing a part coding, uh, then part family formation, then uh, using that part family formation, we got the standard plan preparation and checking those in the standard process plans and do the part coding and family search again for the same part, right? No. If your part is a new one, then you do this process, obviously, and then continue with the rest. But if your part is highly similar to the families you have in your database, then you can continue with this uh, second part. Similar part, let's say right here. But if you have a new part, a totally new part, which does not belong to any family, then you can form a new family by using your new part, uh, do some planning, and then store it in your kind of database, and then continue with this part. So for NIVs, uh, this is the way you go one, two, three, four, five, six. But for the similar parts, what do you do? Uh, seven, eight, nine. Let me write it here. This is how you go for the similar parts, seven, eight, nine, four, five, and six. But for the new part, you should follow such a path. Okay.